Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest is a futurist, the future of work. But before we talk to our guests, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Six Sigma, the man that automates literally everything, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net landmoto.com and most importantly if you're not automating your craigslist and your facebook postings postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek you can always make more money but scott you'll agree you can't get more time you cannot get more time mark how are you i'm great i'm great i'm really excited to talk to our guests about the future the future is here, man. The future is here. It's the future of work, and it's something that I think um, is really important. So let's talk to Jacob Morgan from thefutureorganization.com. If you don't know who Jacob Morgan is, uh, this guy, after having terrible jobs working for other people, he went off and went off on his own to research and explore how work and everything we know about it is changing. Today, Jacob Morgan is one of the world's leading authorities on the future of work, employee experience, and how the workplace is changing. He is a best-selling author, keynote speaker, and futurist who advises business leaders and organizations around the world. Jacob's work has been endorsed by the CEOs of Cisco, T-Mobile, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, Schneider Electric, Best Buy, KPMG, AARP, Pandora, and many others. His latest book, The Employee Experience Advantage, How to Win the War for Talent by Giving Employees the Workspaces They Want, the Tools They Need, and a Culture They Can Celebrate, analyzes over 250 global organizations to determine how to create an organization where people generally want, not need, to show up to work. Jacob Morgan, you're a big deal. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. That's quite an intro. Well, I think, I think you, you've earned it, my friend. Um, Thank you. <laughs> let's, let's, re, let's rewind the tape and let's go back to that first, or, or actually I should say the last terrible job, working for other people. And when, how does the light bulb go off and you become Jacob Morgan, you know, best-selling author and futurist? Well, the light bulb was actually a cup of coffee that the CEO asked me to go get him uh, after he's running late for a meeting. And so he runs out of his office, he hands me a $10 bill and he says, Hey, go get me a cup of coffee and get yourself a latte as well. And, uh, that was, that was a big light bulb moment. Uh, I guess you could say a lightning bolt moment. And at that point I realized that, uh, working for other people sucks and I worked too hard in school to have to go get somebody coffee. And, uh, I was immediately looking at other things I can do. Scott Todd, what do you think? It sounds like the CEO picked the wrong guy to ask for coffee. <laughs> well, you know, I suppose I should be thanking him now because had it not been for that moment, uh, who knows what I'd be doing. So it's, it's one of those um, bittersweet stories. Yeah, so, so Jacob, tell us a little bit about your parents and, you know, what they think about all this. Well, now, thankfully, they're much supportive, uh, much more supportive than they were before. But my parents are from the Republic of Georgia. And, you know, I'm talking about like former USSR, Georgia, not, uh, you know, Georgia, the state. And so I was always grown up or I, would, I grew up with this sort of mentality of uh, work hard, go to school, climb the corporate ladder. So when my parents find out that I was quitting everything and moving to the Bay Area, uh, where I was originally in Los Angeles, you can imagine that they were a little hesitant at first. Uh, telling me that it, would be, it was going to be a bad idea. The cost of living in the Bay Area is very expensive. I was going to struggle. But now my parents are much more um, understanding of what I do. You know, it's been eight to 10 years. So they, <laughs> they kind of understand the move I made and why I did it. Yeah, I mean, Scott, can you imagine, you know, Cole, your daughter saying to you, hey, uh, the CEO just asked me to get him a cup of coffee and um, I'm quitting. <clears throat> And I'm going to follow my dreams. Like as a parent, you'd worry, right? You'd be like, well, come on. You got you to pay your dues. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a typical parental thing to say? 
It, it would. And you know what, Mark? I think that, um, I think that no matter what age you are, uh, parents, you know, like I know my parents when, when uh, I was basically saying, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go do real estate. They, they were like, oh, okay, uh, you don't need a job. You know, like, don't, don't you want to work for a company? Uh, no. <laughs> right. So, you know, I think that the time is different too, but uh, I think it would be kind of a shock for me too. Yeah. Jacob, do you have kids? I do. I have a seven month old daughter. Okay. So if your seven month old daughter, right, did the exact same thing that you did, what do you think, how would you respond? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, and it wasn't just the coffee. It was the fact that I had an hour and a half commute to and from work each day, every day. It was the fact that I went to school and graduated with a degree in economics and psychology. You know, I worked my ass off, graduated with honors, and I was doing drone work. Um, I was just doing very, I was basically lied to because I was told I was going to be doing a lot of uh, exciting and fun projects, traveling, meeting with entrepreneurs, et cetera. And none of that happened. So if my daughter came to me in a similar situation where she um, was told by her, you know, whoever interviewed her that she would be doing one thing and it ended up being another and it was putting a toll on her life and she was unhappy and stressed out, I would say, get the hell out of there. That's what I did. I love it. I love it. I, 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 I'd like to think that I'd be able to put my worry aside and, and let my children, you know, search for happiness and not sort of impose my anxiety on them. But it's hard. I mean, I can imagine, you know, your parents um, kind of freaking out about it. But now today, it's all that hard work for Jacob Morgan has kind is has actually really paid off in in a in a big sort of profound way, and not just monetarily, right? I mean, you're actually making an impact in the world, Jacob. So, what was that transition like, where you went from, you know, corporate lackey to entrepreneur? Not easy. Um, so. <laughs> I, I worked probably, and I still probably work harder and, and, and more than pretty much anybody I know. Um, but it was easier at the time because I was single. I didn't have any outstanding debts. I didn't have a mortgage. So the income that I needed to survive was quite low. And so for me, I took jobs on Craigslist. I started doing all sorts of weird projects, uh, writing articles for $15 an article, um, doing search engine optimization work, online marketing stuff, pretty much anything I could do to prove to myself that I didn't have to work for anyone else. And I would work crazy hours. I mean, I was up till two, three in the morning, pretty much every night, trying to figure out a way to build my brand, build a business, um, get my name out there and get myself known. And um, as I started to see success, that motivated me even more. And as I started to see more success, it pushed me even more. Then there was a point in time where I started to see a lot of um, a lot of trolls pop up. You know, people uh, creating fake Twitter accounts about me, leaving me angry comments on my website, messaging my wife on Twitter in the middle of the night while I was sleeping, trying to tell her to break up with me. So I've had all sorts of um, interesting experiences and stories. And every time something like that happens, I'm I'm first of all like an extremely competitive person. I don't lose well. So all of that stuff uh, kept pushing me to, to, to keep uh, doing what I'm doing. Scott Todd. So um, what, what was the, like the biggest like hurdle? I mean, like you, you're here today, but I mean, like what was that first leap? I mean, like you, you didn't just leave the corporate job and I mean, you know, like become, you know, this, the speaker and author, like what was like the hardest piece of getting that foundation <laughs> to kind of build your overnight success for lack of a better word? Well, I was doing both at the same time. Um, so while I had a full-time job, I was also doing side projects. And once the side projects were bringing in enough money where I could uh, cover my expenses, I switched over to that. So there was a while where I was working completely crazy hours. Um, and one of the other hardest things about being an entrepreneur is the stuff that nobody ever tells you, like the, the boring stuff, the mundane stuff. I mean, you need to get good at taxes. You need to learn how to um, you create proposals, create templates for yourself, build a logo. Like you have to do all sorts of little stuff that is far outside of your skill set and your comfort zone. So you can be the best 
speaker in the world. You can be the best marketer in the world or the best, you know, engineer, whatever it is. But when you become an entrepreneur, when you go off on your own, you also need to be very well versed at all of these other things that you never had any idea you would need to do. And learning about all these things was challenging. And as what I do, uh, as my brand continued to grow, the other big hurdle was learning to give up control and let other people do things for me. So hiring a virtual assistant was a big challenge for me. Uh, I was like, what? I got to give her access to my email. She's going to have access to it. like, it's crazy. And so letting go um, and not being such a control freak was another big, big challenge for me. It still is. I, I feel the same way at, at points. There's, there's times where I let go and then it works and it's like the greatest thing ever. But that point of letting go, it's kind of like bungee jumping, you know? Like, you know, you're not going to die, but you're not so sure you're not going to die. Scott, do you have the same feeling when, when you hire a new VA and you're training them and then you've got to give that last pass password out and you just don't know? Well, it's, what's funny is, uh, I see, I always ease into like with VAs, I always kind of like ease into like, I, I give them a little assignments and then they kind of graduate, you know, like I don't just, here's everything you need. I try to make it so that, uh, they're not, they're not going to destroy the place, even if they, uh, tried to, you know, so I'm not giving them the whole key yet, but I think that it, it is scary when like, uh, a great example more Mark today is I had a VA, uh, that does accounting work for me. She actually emails me this whole conversation. She emails me this whole conversation she had with a customer, and and uh, she's like, "Hey, what what do you think about this?" And um, and I'm like, "Well, how the heck did he even?" First, I'm like, "How did he even get her email address?" Because it's like an internal email address. And what happened was she had sent him an invoice for something, and so then he had her. So he's having a whole conversation with her, and and at that point, you're like, "Oh." <laughs> wow, took a totally different spin, but it is kind of nerve wracking when you see something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So Jacob, I know you're probably sick of this question, but I have to ask it. Are you ready? Of course. What's the future of work? <laughs> that, you know, that is one of the biggest questions that uh, the people always have. And uh, the simple way that I always respond to that is uh, there's many futures of work. Uh, the big common assumption that we always make is that A, there is one single future of work and B, the future of work is something that happens to us instead of being something that we actually create. So there are many potential scenarios for what the future can look like, right? This is part of what the, the job of a futurist is, is to be able to help organizations not be surprised by what the future might, might bring. So take something like AI and automation, for example. Um, like I can't tell you in the future, every human is going to be replaced by a robot. I don't know that. That is one potential scenario. That is one potential future that might happen. Another one is that plenty of new jobs will be created and humans won't get automated. A third potential scenario is that, um, you know, the White House, for example, just recently made an announcement that they don't, they're not worried about automation or AI for the next 50 or 100 years, which is a completely ignorant thing for them to say. But Another potential scenario is that the government is going to block any potential AI and automation developments that happen. So my job is to essentially work with organizations and say, look, these are potential options and scenarios for what might happen. And we need to be prepared and have a plan for all three. And by the way, what is the future you would like to see happen? And how do we work towards building that? So when I hear the question, what is the future of work? Um, it's not really something that I can predict or answer. My uh, response is always, there are several futures. Um, we need to pick the one that we would like to see come to fruition and build towards that one. That's a great answer. And, you know, I, I have to ask the question about the employee experience advantage. And I know the book just came out. Um, and you've analyzed over 250 global organizations to determine how to create an organization where people genuinely want to work. Jacob Morgan, of the 250 that you analyzed, you got to dust off your resume today. Where would you submit? What three organizations of the ones that you uh, analyzed would you submit your own resume and why? I would not submit my resume to any of them. I, uh, <laughs> and interestingly enough, 
I've been offered many jobs uh, since I've been off on my own, uh, fairly prestigious jobs at various uh, global organizations. And I always turn them down. Um, A, because I'm doing quite well on my own and B, there's something to be said about having the freedom and flexibility to, um, well, as you guys know, control the life uh, and build the life that you want. So no, I, I, I know, but let's just pretend. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, it, I know. I know it's I'm, not, a, I know it's not a realistic question, but just, just so that we know, like, okay, you know, not maybe for Jacob Morgan, but if someone out there was looking at, at a great sure, organization yeah. to sort of Who model the their scoring? own organization. So some of the highest scoring organizations, I'll phrase it that way. There were 15 organizations that scored well out of the 252. So that alone gives you some context around how screwed up the corporate world is is that only 6% of the companies did a good job of the employee experience uh, rankings. And some of them were uh, Facebook, Cisco, Google, LinkedIn, uh, Riot Games, uh, the popular gaming company scored quite well. Uh, Airbnb was another one. And Microsoft and Accenture were two others, uh, if I didn't already mention those. So those are all great organizations that uh, scored highly across culture, technology, and physical space. And as much as I love all of them and have worked with all of them, I wouldn't take a full-time job uh, working for any of them. Okay, fair enough. So, I mean, like what, what makes these companies, the ones that you just named, like what is it? I mean, you just kind of, you just kind of said three criteria. Was, was it workspace, technology, and? Culture. Culture. Okay, so what, what is it about these, these companies that, you know, kind of – uh, becomes kind of like that best in class or, you know, that, that global best in class that allows them to stand, stand out. And, you know, like why are, why are more companies not doing that? That is another very common question that, uh, that people ask and not, not to sound corny, but it, these are organizations that, uh, that care. Um, so these are organizations who go above and beyond investing in perks uh, to actually redesigning workplace practices around their people. So it's one thing to go to an organization, uh, you know, let's say you have two companies, company A and company B. Uh, company A, you commute to and from the office, you sit in the cubicle, people are taking credit for your work, there's lots of bureaucracy, uh, you're using technologies mm -hmm. that look like they were designed in the 80s and 90s, but at the same time, you get free food, at the same time, you, uh, um, you get access to various uh, training programs, you get yoga on site, massages, a mechanic comes out to change uh, the oil in your car. And then you have another organization. And the other organization, they don't have as many of these perks, but you're treated well, you have uh, modern relevant technologies, the annual employee review is gone and is replaced by something that's a little bit more catered to the year that we live in. People aren't taking credit for your work, you have managers that are supportive, uh, you have a flexible work environment. You have more accountability and say in how your work gets done. You have more of a voice in the company. So most people would prefer to work for company B because company B has actually redesigned the workplace practices around you, the individual. You might not have free food. You might, but you might not. You might not have yoga, but the core workplace practices have changed. And so most organizations today in the world are very obsessed with this short-term idea of Let's give employees perks so that they shut up and keep working. And it's much harder for an organization to say, we got a bigger, longer term problem here and we need to focus on that. Um, and that's why you have some great organizations and many that are not. Scott Todd worked for a Fortune 300 organization. I'm very sorry to yeah. hear that. And yeah, me I, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so Scott, which organization was your organization? Does, was it more like A or more like B? Well, trend it 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 pivoted, you know, when when the leadership was um, was kind of changed too, right? So, um, you know, the the company that I worked for, the leadership that I worked under for the most time, was really was really about um, you know building technology, not more so for customer facing issues than, um, you know, for the, the staff, the staff kind of worked on the stuff that's from the eighties. Okay. And I mean, that's true. Um, there, there was a huge investment in employees. Okay. So, I mean, this company took, you know, took the, the top, uh, employees worldwide on trips and invested in, in true meetings for education experiences. And there was no free food, but you know, this whole, this whole thing was like, Hey, let's, let's educate and empower our employees 
And I got a lot of benefit from that. And you know, you could see the benefits to me as the employee. As the new leadership came in, it was this pivot was, hey, we're, we're not going to do these trips and we're not going to do, uh, we're not going to do the employee education and we're stopping that immediately. And we're going to pivot and start focusing on um, kind of our employee facing technology. And, you know, the, the feeling when that pivot happened was not very good. The culture really did. I mean, we, we spent a lot of time building a culture that kind of with leadership just crashed almost immediately. And that company is still, I don't think it's still back financially from, I, I know it's not back financially from, from where it was. I mean, it performed much better when that, em, that emphasis was on the employee and not, uh, let's build it for systems or, you know, other pieces. So that's, that's, yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's heartbreaking to, to, to kind of go yeah. through that. That stock when is down think, 85%. Yeah. yeah. That's how, that's the yeah. impact, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I also think that the reality, unfortunately, is that most organizations and leaders who represent them are, um, are cowards. <laughs> They, you know, it takes a special kind of person to go in front of uh, uh, stockholders, shareholders, in front of your company, in front of your management team, and commit to creating a place where people want to show up. Like, that's a hard thing to do. Um, it's much easier to be the coward that says, I'm going to keep things going the way they are. I'm going to collect my big bonus. I'll be here for a couple of years, and then I'm going to leave and like the hell with this place. And the reality is that I think most um, organizations, we have done an excellent job of creating a coward factory where not only are the managers and the executives there cowards, but so are a lot of the employees who work there because that is the environment that we create. We want people to shut up and not ask any questions and to do their monotonous job over and over again. And those are the organizations that we're going to see continuing to struggle. I mean, that's what we've seen with companies like Sears. That's what we've seen with organizations like Blockbuster. And it's what we continue to see with plenty of other companies today. It's, it's really interesting. I, I read an article that, uh, and I forgot the exact rate, but I, I kind of, um, the exact number, but I kind of chuckled at it because what, what it said was that the, uh, you know, back, back in uh, the last century, the lifespan of a fortune 500 company was, I forgot the exact number, 50 years. The lifespan of a fortune 500 company today is 15 years, you know? So like you'll see a lot more turnover in that fortune 500. You'll see, uh, you'll see these companies that were once very large crumble a lot faster. Sears, you know, the, these companies that are no longer, I mean, Sears is circling the drain, I think, but, um, yeah, and the S and P five hundred. Those on the S and P five hundred. Those have been shrinking as well. Fortune one hundred, like you said, shrinking. Yeah. And look, let's be honest. These companies deserve to disappear. Right. Um, I mean, if if you, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's no nice way to say it, right? These companies are organizations that deserve to not be in existence. Um, the same is true in a relationship, right? I mean, if you do not treat your spouse well, hey, you deserve to be alone. Uh, nobody deserves to to deal with any kind of abuse that you're going to give them. So if you don't treat your people well, you don't treat your spouse well, you should not be surprised when you're single or when people don't want to work for you. Yeah, I agree. You know, the other, the other thing that, that I really, as an employee of that, that A, you know, example that we had, you know, one of the things that, that um, I thought was really interesting was the fact that we did quarterly, we call them pulse surveys, where it was, it was like the health of the employee. Like it was 10 questions that we answered. It was a big initiative. We want everybody answering these 10 questions and, you know, it was on a scale of one to five and you were shooting for a best in class or world class, which is a 4.0 or higher. And there was a lot of, a lot of emphasis put around, Hey, how do we create a, an organization that's better from the employee's standpoint or view? I'm telling you, day one of the new regime, gone. We, we don't care about the employees. And I'm telling you, you know, like it, it is heartbreaking and, and it, it's painful when you see this culture literally just get dumped. And I agree. I think that if, if they can't, if companies can't be relevant to their employees, they probably won't be relevant for much longer either. Yep. And you, uh, as an employee, you, I mean, everybody needs to make a decision like you clearly did that you don't want to be a part of that and you're going to leave that environment and go do something else. And, yeah. you know, for some employees, it's worth for them to battle it out and try to change the company from the inside. And for others, it's worth for them to leave. So 
it's one of those things where everyone needs to take a step back. And if you're working for an unpleasant um, organization, is it worth the battle to have uh, and make that choice? So Jacob, I've got a, I got a question. It's kind of a personal question. Um, I got a buddy who hates his job, um, is in a, in a role that he doesn't like, and he's kind of a fairly young guy. I think he's 30, right? So he wants to be a developer, but he's in a support role right now, and he's just miserable, right? And he's been miserable for a while, but he's also living month to month. What advice would you give this guy to get out of that situation where the problem is, is that he's drained by the job. So he doesn't have the energy to look for <laughs> another job, nor does he have the, 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 the order. Does he think, does he have the, the, the resume to get the job that he wants? How, how, what, what, what advice would you give him? Quit live with your parents for a while and build up their resume. Um, I mean, there's unfortunately, sometimes you have to take a step back in order to take two steps forward. And a lot of times people will either stay at jobs um, that aren't a good fit or they will take projects that are not a good fit because their mentality is that they want to keep up their current lifestyle. They want to have things the way they are. And unfortunately, you only have so many hours in a day and so much effort that you could put in in a day. So if all of your time and effort is spent at a job that is sucking the life out of you or working on a project that is sucking the life out of you, that's no time or effort that you're able to put towards something that you want to see come to fruition. And so sometimes what you have to do is cut away the bad parts so that you can focus on the good part. Now, there are some people, of course, who can do both at the same time. I mean, what I did, uh, you know, I had a shitty job working for somebody else. And at that same time, I was using every spare moment that I had trying to build up a profile for myself so that I could then later uh, take a job that I wanted. So you got to decide what the best course of action is for you. Uh, for me, my backup plan was if everything goes to hell, I'm going to move back in with my parents. Uh, and, you know, I, I lived with my parents for a while while I built up my, my, uh, um, my skill set uh, to be able to go off on my own. So if I were this person, I would say you have two choices. Uh, well, three, actually. You stay at your crappy job and stop complaining about it. Uh, choice number two is you quit this job and you take a step back, move in with your parents for a little while, um, take a deep breath, uh, de-stress a little bit, and build up a profile for yourself in the area that you want. Or C, which is the hardest option, is you do both at the same time. So you have that job that you don't like that pays your bills and covers your expenses. And in your spare time, you go out and you build this brand for yourself. Um, do a couple of projects at discounted rates, find things on Craigslist, uh, build, build a website that you can show off to others, and then look for those types of roles and opportunities that you can get. But none of these options are, um, how should you say, rosy. Uh, they're not, none of them are, uh, you know, cheerful, everything's going to be fine. Like whichever option you pick, it's going to suck for a little while and, until you can go in that direction that you want to go in. And that's just the reality. All right. I love it. So, um, Scott, any, any more questions for Jake before we go to the tip of the week? No, I think we're good. Uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. Although, you know what I'd like to know, Jacob? What, what do you believe about the future of work that other people think is crazy? Huh. Well, so we are very obsessed in general with this idea of AI and robots and automation. So, one of the things that I still believe is that even in that kind of a world, no organization on this planet can survive without people. Yet every organization in the world can survive without technology. You know, technology is a great thing to have, but it's not, I mean, you can survive without technology. So even in a world where we have AI and automation and all these wonderful tools and technologies, you still need to think about people. You still need to think about talent. And that conversation is oftentimes very lost in the um, discussions we're having around the future of work. We're very much obsessed with uh, tech and AI and losing our jobs. And nobody ever talks about the actual humans, the actual people that are uh, still dominating the workforce. 
You know, while you're talking, uh, Siri and Alexa both threw rocks at my monitor. So that's weird. Yeah, that no, they, uh, they do that stuff. And, um, you know, as much as I love Siri and, well, actually I hate Siri, but I love uh, the Amazon uh, Echo. Um, as much as I love the Amazon Echo, you know, you still need, um, and you guys work with uh, VAs, with assistants, whatnot. There's something to be said about having a human that you can engage with um, to a point where they can kind of relate and empathize and, and do the things that it's almost like you feel like they can read your mind sometimes. And we're not going to get to that point for AI and software and automation, uh, at least in the near future. Not, not in our lifetime, you don't think? Well, no, in our lifetime, um, you know, a lot of predictions say that by 2045, we're going to be close to um, replicating the human brain. But uh, most of these AI and automation discussions seem to focus on the next five, 10 years. And I don't think in the five to 10 year period, we're going to have that level of uh, AI. All right. Well, now is the time. We're going to put you on the spot. And Jacob, your, your mentorship has been amazing. But I'm going to ask you for one more last tip. A website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the Art of Passive Income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? So, well, there are a couple things. Um, if, if it's a piece of actionable advice that you can take, it's not a website specifically, but it's an action that you can do. If it's at your company and you have a full-time job, the best piece of actionable advice that I can give you is to speak up. Um, it's to have a voice inside of your company, participate in beta programs around workplace initiatives if they have them. Uh, if there are internal collaboration tools that your company uh, deploys, use them, build your own personal brand inside of your company and outside. If you are working in an organization and you are unhappy, best piece of actionable advice is simply go start small and create a profile on a site like upwork.com or catalant.com or freelancer.com and see if you're able to make um, or to generate some sort of income on the side in addition to the full-time work um, that you're doing and see how it goes. Uh, I think a lot of us are very much obsessed with reading things, looking at things, talking about things and not as much actually doing things. So best piece of actionable advice is uh Stop talking and, and start doing. I love it. I love it. Uh, Scott Todd, what is your tip of the week? All right, Mark. I'd like for you to check out this website. It's called coschedule.com. I know coschedule.com very well. Oh, man. It's a marketing. Well, if you know it, I mean, maybe. Well, you I just know. I, I, yeah, I can tell. You can tell Jacob. He probably doesn't know because it's not so as geeky it is. It is a marketing. Uh, how do I explain it? It's a marketing kind of calendar mm -hmm. and it brings in all your content marketing, your social media marketing, all your marketing projects, your blog management all, all onto one platform. You can write your blog posts from there. You can send them out to social media. You kind of manage this whole like content empire right from this one dashboard. And it also does do some automated marketing for you. So kind of cool. I think it's really cool. And, and actually on uh, the uh, webinar that I give, I actually talk about coschedule.com forward slash headline dash analyzer as a way to create really compelling headlines for your Craigslist ads. So I think coschedule is great. Um, another competitor is meetedgar.com, which, yeah. th which, which is also great. Jacob, yeah. have you heard of coschedule and meetedgar? Uh, I have heard of both of those. Yes. I mean, you know, as somebody, um, even though I, I do a lot of speaking and advising for organizations, part of my job is to keep building the brand for myself. So, you know, I use things like Infusionsoft. Um, I'm constantly looking at ways to optimize Facebook ads to, for content that I create. I'm constantly looking at all these different technologies and tools that I can use for my team to improve the way that they're working. And so uh, I am familiar with Meet Edgar and with CoSchedule. I can't say I use either of them, but uh, maybe I will revisit both of them. Yeah, yeah. And also friends don't let friends write crappy headlines. And you can download their Ultimate Power Words uh, worksheet as well. So um, very cool. Uh, but my, sorry guys, but my tip of the week is the best one because it is to learn more about Jacob Morgan at the future organization.com. Check out 
the latest book, The Employee Experience Advantage. And uh, Jacob, this has been great. It really has been. I want to thank you. So are, are we good? I, hey, I, uh, I'm grateful that you guys brought me on. And I appreciate the plug for the, for the book and the website. And um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, unless you guys have any other questions for me, I'm just grateful that you guys thought of me to bring me on. You know, this is, it's not a topic that I get to talk about frequently. Most of the time, um, my days spent looking at the, the future of X, Y, Z. And so talking about the entrepreneurial aspects, the building your personal brand aspects are things that I'm really passionate about, but I don't frequently get to talk about. So this was a refreshing um, discussion for me. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, were there any questions we should have asked you that we didn't? Oh man, that you should have asked me. Um, no, uh, I don't think so. But if you can think of one right now, go for it. Well, we'll just have you back on if that's the case. There you go. Scott, are, are we good? We're good. <laughs> we're good, Mark. <laughs> all right. All right. So I want to remind the listeners the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like Jacob Morgan from thefutureorganization.com to come on this podcast is if you do us three small favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We are going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Today's podcast is sponsored by paymentgeek.io. Automate your payments, manage your borrowers, all within one beautiful software experience, paymentgeek.io. All right. You ready, Scott? Let's go. One, two, three. Let freedom ring. That was kind of sad, guys. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know... The, f- the future of podcasting just went way down. Jacob's going to pod- he's gonna, he's gonna blog about this. The future of podcasts. Do not do a, a t- uh, like a tagline at the end of it. I, I have a podcast as well, so I can totally relate to all the stuff that you guys are talking about. All right. Yeah. Have us on the podcast, Jacob, and talk about the future of passive income. There you go. That might be a good topic. I, th- I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, do you think your, your listeners would be interested in that or they're pretty much interested in, in you know, their, their, their big companies? Um, well, you know, they tend to be more interested in uh, the, the future of work kind of stuff and how the organizations are changing, uh, senior leaders at organizations and whatnot. So eh, maybe not. We it's literally have no it. value to give your listeners at that point. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Scott, actually, Scott could. I don't think I could. I think I could. Scott could. I can't. I could tell a good story. Yeah. But um, all right. Well, thanks, Jacob. I want to thank the listeners and uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you.